Tonight, we're looking at the topic of science and specifically trying to answer the person who says, well, I was a person of faith, but now I have science. I have, I have had this exact thing said to me uh, only maybe two months ago. I was talking to uh, my dad, many of you will know, was in a pretty bad vehicle accident and uh, brain injury and speaking to his neurosurgeon, who I happen to know, <clears throat> who was someone in this church uh, about half a decade ago and um, haven't seen him for in, a, in a very long time, that, that much time. And he basically said, oh, there may or may not be a God, but for me, I'm a, I'm a man of science now. And so I don't need, like, here's my editorial on, on his, what he said. Uh, I don't need that anymore uh, because I have the concrete rationality of science and a scientific, naturalistic, materialistic worldview <clears throat> and no longer need the fairy tales of faith. And it's not an uncommon story. And so we're, get, we're going to be looking at this today. Uh, so I thought it would be really good to hear from someone among us. I know we have many, many doctors. We have uh, many people in our church community of PhDs uh, in science, scientific fields who are uh, researchers and practitioners and um, work in uh, all, all kinds of areas, commercial and academic. Um, one of those is Tangela, who's going to come and Tell us a little bit about his story. Uh, come on down. You can welcome him up if you like. I was like medium simmer level of welcome, but that's okay. C come on over this way a little bit. Got to share a microphone so it hits the, uh, the camera there. So maybe just for, for our sake, people who don't know you, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, what you've studied, and maybe why you're here in Adelaide right now. Sure. Uh, I'm Tang Lao. I am a theoretical physicist. I work at Flinders University. So I yeah, studied physics. Um, so that's what I did for my bachelor's and then moved to Japan for my grad school uh, in physics and then to Germany for a postdoc. A couple of other cities in, in Australia before ending here in Flinders, Flinders, uh, well, at, at Flinders University. Um, so I guess the story is uh, Flinders University wanted to invest. Well, Flinders University has, has uh, a history of expertise in electron momentum spectroscopy. And they invested in this awesome new microscope called a photo emission electron microscope. And this microscope needs uh, a little bit of, um, I guess, interpreting of what the results, uh, of what that microscope turns out. So um, uh, they, were, they were looking for a condensed matter physicist. And um, long story short, I found the job ad, I applied for that job ad, and found myself coming to Adelaide for that position. Alrighty, so uh, what is kind of the range of things that a theoretical physicist would think about and and do? Like we, we've heard a bit about what you're specifically doing. Uh, what's kind of the range of a theoretical physicist? That's a very big range, I would say, uh, from string theory, um, um, particle physics, uh, condensed matter physics, um, atmospheric physics. Every single uh, field of physics has its own theoretical aspect. So I guess I'm, I'm just happy to be part in, of this little, small um, part of physics called materials physics or, physics or condensed matter physics. But uh, the range is quite huge for a theoretical physicist. OK, so uh, was there something that you were interested in as a young person? You just uh, you saw a particular, you had a particular aptitude for it or uh, particularly interested in it or there's an opp opportunity in it. How did you end up in this field? That's a good question. I, I did realize that I was very interested in science um, when I was a kid. So I, I, I do remember going to the garden and just getting fridge magnets and just observing magnetic fields from the particles I, I could get from the garden. So from that point on, I, I already knew that I would like to be a scientist um, and I just pursued it. Okay, so uh, we're looking at this topic today. Uh, burnt, you know, reasons why I left the church or left the faith altogether. One of the reasons that people have given and tend to give is, well, I don't need faith, this wishy-washy kind of uh, no, no evidence and just trusting in things that I can't see because now I have science, which is things that I can see and touch and experiment, and this is providing me the answers, so I don't need these other kinds of answers. But here you are in a church, a man of faith who is also a man of science. How can you be both? 
for you? Another very good question. Um, I guess we're living in an age where we are being indo indoctrinated in universities and basically everywhere in the media that science has the answer to every question in life. Um, but I, I have to question that. It's, it's basically, um, I, I guess an analogy would be if, if you believe that science can answer every big question in life, it's, um, it's like saying that you could use a stethoscope to assess a broken heart. Um, there are things that science are really good at, um, explaining the physical um, phenomena that we observe, um, but there are questions that science cannot answer, like what is a human being? Um, of course, there's an, a scientific aspect to that, but um, what is it really to live as a human being? Uh, why, why are we here? Um, is there more to living and dying? Uh, is, is there more to life than just living and dying? Um, and so it's this, I guess, passion of mine to answer the bigger questions um, that led me to both being a scientist and also a Christian, because I think being only a scientist does not really fulfill every single, does not really answer every question that I have um, in, in life. So, um, and yeah, so I just hope that people realize that, that science is awesome. It's given us vaccines, it's given us technology, it's given us so many things that we, we enjoy right now. But ultimately, it does not really answer probably the biggest questions of life. Thanks, man. So, I mean, lastly, you kind of answered there. You don't see any difficulty in being a person who loves science and a person who loves, who also loves Jesus. Absolutely no difficulty. And, and that's um, been the case for a lot of scientists in the past. Isaac Newton, Francis Bacon, who um, basically gave us modern science, was a Christian. Um, Robert Boyle, um, Francis Collins, uh, so many scientists in the past and present um, did not find this difficult, and I also am not finding this difficult um, molding or putting science and faith together. That's great. Thanks, Hayes, man. Really, really appreciate you uh, letting us in on a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do and how you reconcile that with your faith. That's really great. Thank you. Thank Please uh, help me thank yeah. Tang Lao. Appreciate it, man. Well, so... Here is the thing. So, um, I don't. Re do I really need to preach a sermon? Um, I do. Going back to my neurosurgeon mate, uh, I asked him later after we had forty-five minutes of discussion about faith and life. I said, "So, you say you're a person of science now, not a person of faith. Do you know anybody in in this field?" who is also a Christian or has faith. And he said, oh, actually, yeah, my boss, uh, like the head of this whole unit, brilliant neurosurgeon, uh, really very well-respected, um, you know, neurosurgeon and, and scientist, essentially, uh, is a man of very deep convictional faith in Jesus. And I was like, well, we, we can, I mean, I don't want to just appeal to authority and say, well, there are, just like Tang Lao mentioned, even just you yourself, uh, there are people who are at the top of their field in science who also have a deep and abiding and growing faith in Jesus. Therefore, it's not necessarily true to say that you cannot be a person of science and a person of faith. But so that we might see how people come to this place and how we might help them, I do want to open up Scripture and have a look at... Um, how we might better help people. Again, we don't want to try to puff ourselves up with great intellectual arguments to go and smash people down with our better arguments or intellectual superiority. That's not what we do in this series. We want to understand where we have been at fault or we have um, aided in people's abandoning the faith or leaving the church by our ourselves not proclaiming or not living in light of what we proclaim. Uh, but also how we might help answer some of the questions that they might have. So let me pray and uh, we'll get stuck into it. Father God, I want to thank you for uh, our, our friend Tang Lao here. Thank you for the work you've done in his life, bringing him into your family. And for all of us, act up, acting upon us with such love and grace and mercy, you're so good to us. So help us tonight to have a greater appreciation for your creation, 
help us to have a greater curiosity for how you are at work in the world and through the natural order of things. And then in every way, we might bring you glory with our lives, with our words. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am not a scientist. Uh, you could put me in the box of like curious nerd for sure. Love researching things. Got a background in journalism. And basically, every time I come to preach, uh, I, I, I mean, do have a background in theology as well. But my goal is not to preach kind of my own understanding or good ideas or my own authority, um, but always to defer to a greater authority, chiefly the Scriptures. So week by week, um, I hope and my goal is to open up the Word of God and to help you understand who God is, His character, um, more about Him and His work in the world, who you are without Him, who you are with Him, who you are in Him, how it should relate to one another, to the world and to God in light of His Scriptures and in light of the work of His Spirit in you and through you. And today, because I put it to you, we can't go to Scripture like we would go to a scientific textbook. I also want to appeal to some authorities like Pangla, who we had up before, and others, even some that he mentioned before. Uh, but first... <clears throat> the, my goal for this sermon is that you would have great confidence in God. You would see that there is no conflict between science and faith in Jesus. And hopefully, thirdly, if we can, that you would see science as a means or as a, a, a route to a greater understanding of who God is, a greater appreciation of the magnificence of His creative power and His work in the world. That's my hope. That's my goal. So let me start with Scripture. This is from Mark 2. <clears throat> this is Mark writing about Jesus. He says, When he entered uh, Capernaum again after several days, it was reported that he was at home. So many people gathered together, so there was no more room, not even in the doorway, and he was speaking the word to them. They came to him bringing a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they were not able to bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and after digging through it, they lowered the mat on which the paralytic was lying. Seeing their faith, Jesus told the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there, questioning in their hearts, Why does he speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Right away, Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were thinking like this within themselves. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he told the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Immediately he got up, took the mat and went out in front of everyone. As a result, they were all astounded and gave glory to God saying, we have never seen anything like this. So I know what you're thinking. Why? are you using a passage of Scripture that has a supernatural act to try to talk about there being no conflict between science and faith? That, that doesn't seem to work. Let me explain why. Here you have a miracle, something outside of the ordinary natural order of things. Jesus does this not to show off, that's not his goal, certainly to help this man, that's part of his goal, but mostly to demonstrate that he, Jesus, sitting there, is God over creation. He claims this title for himself, Son of Man, directly referring to Daniel, uh, who all these scribes and Pharisees would have been well aware of, pointing to this one who was to come, this, this God figure. And Jesus says, that's me. I am that God. He says to the man, I forgive you. I forgive you. And these Pharisees and scribes are there, they're, they are outraged. They're saying, you are blessed. You are claiming to be God. Nobody can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. And Jesus says, that's right. That's right. Only God can forgive sins. Let me show you that I am God. Here's what one scripture writer says of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. You see Jesus. You see a God that you cannot see. 
the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him, in Jesus, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So in this story, Jesus is first pointing to the natural order of things, saying, he is a paralytic. He cannot do anything by natural means, in Jesus' time especially. Not, nothing. But... Jesus says, uh, I am the God over creation. I can forgive sins, like I just said I can. And I can interact with my own creation however I see fit. He produced the order of creation, and he can intervene in his creation as he sees fit, as the God who made everything. And he does so here to demonstrate that he can forgive sins. If we zoom out, we see on a macro level, the God of creation who is so mighty, so powerful, so just purely volitional, does whatever he pleases, breathes, and whole galaxies, the whole universe has to come into existence in obedience to his voice. He is the God who, by him and through him and in him, everything was made, he intervenes in his own creation by stepping into his creation he intervenes by changing the natural order of things in the natural order of things because of our sin and rebellion we were dead in our sin on the path to destruction but because the creator god intervened in the natural order of things by his own will out of his own love for us he did so so that he could forgive people their debt to God, forgive people their sins. And so here we see with the paralytic this, this micro expression of the macro reason that Jesus came. The creator God who set everything in order by his will and in accordance with his nature. He is an ordered God and we see order in creation. But he intervened so that he could forgive Although we see implications of the natural order of things in Scripture, like, for example, uh, the book of Job, probably the, the earliest book of the Bible that was ever actually written down. So the, the first book of the Bible in terms of authorship has in it uh, details of astronomy that have really only become well-known or scientifically discovered, if you like, in the last couple of hundred years. And so, but, but even, even so... We don't go to Scripture as we would a scientific textbook. We looked at this a couple of weeks ago when we looked at health. Um, <clears throat> we, don't, we, we don't read the Bible literally where the Bible is meant to be read literarily as a piece of literature where sometimes it's poetic and sometimes it's history. Sometimes it is meant to be read literally. This is Jesus saying, this is how it is. Take this at absolute face value. And then at times you have poetry or apocalyptic writing, uh, which tells us truths about things that aren't to be taken literally, but are telling us truths about a literal God doing a literal thing. It's primarily a collection of God-inspired writing to help us understand the things we can't understand from our observations of the world around us. Like, who is God? Not, is there a God? Uh, we see most people alive and most people who have ever lived by the natural order of things, understanding that there is a God. Uh, even Paul writes in Romans, says, uh, since what can be known about God is evident because God has shown it for his invisible attributes, that is his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen since the creation of the world, being understood through what has been made. So man, people can look around and, and what I hope to show you today is that science is the business of discovering more of God's greatness. Which is why Christians should never be afraid of science. Shouldn't be antagonistic towards science. 
maybe um, naturalism, and we'll get to the distinguishing features between science and naturalism or materialism, which is a philosophy uh, which some scientists hold to. But like, who is God? Who is God to us? If we are to relate to God, what is the nature of that relationship? We can't determine these things through what we call general revelation, just understanding more of the world around us. God has specifically revealed these things to us in Jesus and through His work and in His Scriptures and by His Holy Spirit and through His church. So we want to look at the inspired book of Scripture to see how we should relate to God. But we also look at the book of nature and see how is God at work, what is God like, how magnificent, how phenomenal is this God that made all of these things. Some scientists, some we've already heard about, like uh, Galileo and Kepler and Magnus, grandfather of geology, uh, Bowen, who founded modern chemistry, Copernicus, the astronomer, uh, Pascal, Kelvin, Boyle, Mendel, Faraday, uh, Planck, the quantum theory, Planck, um, in large part, uh, those who launched a scientific rev uh, revolution not only saw no conflict between science and faith, but their faith directed and motivated their science. They wanted to discover truth. If we as Christians, and this is something that we've looked at every week this series, we want to be people of truth. We are not people who are afraid of truth. So where there is a truth, like we looked at in the, the um, leaders who have fallen week, we don't need to hide truth or sweep truth under the rug to try to make the church or faith in Jesus more appealing and more palatable. Because if it is truth, and it is, it can stand up to every other truth. And in fact, exposing, like Paul writes in Ephesians 4, exposing the fruitless deeds of darkness like leaders who are in sin aids our gospel witness, doesn't detract from it. Likewise, we have nothing to fear from science. We should love science. Uh, a lot of these people are very old and very dead. You might say, well, what about modern, modern scientists? People like uh, physicist John Polkinghorne, he said this, you know what, I believe in quarks. You know why? Because it makes sense of all the other evidence that's available. He says, I also believe in God. Why? Even though I've never seen him, it makes sense of all the evidence I see out there. Francis Collins, we heard it before. He's become, I mean, he was already pretty famous, even if, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, headed up the Human Genome Project, uh, but then also really spearheaded much of the, the uh, global efforts uh, in uh, finding vaccines for COVID. And in fact, a lot of his earlier work on the human gen uh, genome helped get to those vaccines and, and other kinds of vaccines and other kinds of understandings of, um, of how people and biology works. He is a practicing Christian, loves Jesus. And he said uh, concepts like the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics helps him to see the glory of God in his work as a scientist. There was one, um, the most recent survey I can find from Pew Research into practicing scientists has found that over half, I mean, it's just over half, 51%, over half of people employed as scientists in their study have, I don't know, I need to represent as well, uh, believe that there is some creator deity so they're not necessarily ascribing to a christian god but a a god who created who's responsible for everything that we see and know and don't know that number dropped down to 10 percent of scientists in the academy so people who are teaching science one out of ten believe in a god but of practicing scientists over half believe in a, in a God who created. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman, astrophysicist, she said, God is responsible for everything. So by studying more of nature, you're enriching your understanding of God. She says, interestingly, I don't hear much about this conflict idea in my daily work with scientists. When I do talk to people, I find that most people really realize that there are deeper questions of life that science can't fully address, and they don't see why there should be any conflict 
between science and faith. I have like 80 other uh, quotes I could read from scientists at the absolute top, like global top of their industry, of their, of their game, of their field, who not only have no problem being Christians and also scientists, but find their faith propels them with a sense of curiosity about how the world works, which leads to them glorifying God. What about some of these objections? One objection I hear is that Christianity is opposed to science. Won't listen to science or contradict science. The problem, my major problem with this objection is that it's true. That there are Christians who are incredibly suspicious of scientists and science generally, who think that science is a problem for faith. This is one of the one of the earliest schisms of science and faith back in Galileo's day, where Galileo, in response to, out of a deep devotion to his faith, wanted to find the truth of things, thought, well, maybe the universe doesn't revolve around the earth. Maybe the earth revolves around the sun. Maybe we're not in the middle of the universe. Maybe we're kind of in the grandstands of the universe with this amazing view of how the universe works as a Christian presenting this, and other Christians saying, no, this is a threat to us. So Christian against Christian, not science against Christian. But I'll put it to you, it's easy to, just like we might look at some scientists who are really materialists, who wear the badge of scientists, but are actually philosophically materialists, not philosophically scientists per se, uh, as an, as, uh, who are outliers in the scientific realm and say, well, all science is bad. Likewise, they might look over at Christians and see some vocal Christians suspicious of science and say, well, all Christians uh, are anti-science. We don't want to look at either direction and take outliers, make them representative of the whole. But also, we need to, as Christians, represent our position better, that we are not afraid of truth. We are the truth people. We, if anything, want more science, not less science. We believe, as we do, uh, that a proper reckoning of the world, a proper understanding of how things work, will lead to a better understanding of God, not lead away from God. We should be pro-science. And in fact, I'll, I'll put it to you, most Christians are. We've done a poor job historically, especially in recent years. Secondly, uh, this God of the gaps, again, some of these vocal Christians who say, well, we understand all of this, and we understand all of this from science, but see these gaps here, stuff that you don't know? Aha! That's where, that's where God is. Uh, but for us, we reject this God of the gaps theory. We don't subscribe to God of the gaps. Even um, many years ago, during World War II, German theologian Amado Bonhoeffer, he said, how wrong is it to use God as a stopgap for the incompleteness of our knowledge? In fact, if, in fact, the frontiers of knowledge are being pushed further and further back, and that's bound to be the case, like we're discovering more and more all the time, then God is being pushed back with them and is therefore continually in retreat. We are to find God in what we know, not in what we don't know. We don't believe in a God of the gaps. Like we, science has discovered all this stuff, but all of this stuff is yet to be discovered, and maybe some of it will be undiscoverable, and that's because God. No, no, we rejected that. God is not just in the gaps. God is over everything. We see the wonder and the amazing, like the majesty of God in all of creation. Again, from our passage today, for by him all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, rules, authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. We don't just marvel at the things we don't understand, because we might understand them in a few years. We marvel at all of it especially the things that as we, as we, I'm not making any, disco any scientific discoveries. I mean, we like as humans, as, as humans discover more about the knowable, but as yet unknown universe, we marvel all the more at how amazing God is. Like how some things behave as particles 
when you're looking at them and as waves when you're not looking at them. Blows my mind that like these non-sentient things can behave differently depending on whether or not humans are looking at them. Or that other things can seemingly come in and out of existence. Just how do those, that's amazing. It doesn't lead to disbelief in God for Christians. It leads us to go, wow. And we want to learn more about it. And we want to discover it. We should be curious about these things because it gives us more of God to worship. Science is no threat to Christianity. No threat to faith in God. Oh boy. Okay. Uh, I have a lot more to talk about and not very much time. So, let's skip evolution. I have spoken about it at length previously, so by all means go and, and uh, look up some of the, uh, the past podcasts. But I will say that uh, there are many different perspectives on how we humans got here, uh, the age of the earth and all those kind of things uh, held by... Christians who love Jesus, who understand the gospel, uh, and I'll say that your perspective on how we got here should be should be no barrier to either your appreciation of science or your faith in Jesus. I understand. I gave you a conclusion with none of the working out. I, I hate that. Okay, let me spend two minutes here. Two minutes. <clears throat> Christianity is not a choose your own adventure faith, so I'm not saying just pick the one you like the most. What I'm saying is that no matter which of these you subscribe to, it should not be a barrier to faith. You can go to scriptures, because again, we're not going to scripture as a scientific textbook to to teach us how the world came into existence, other than that God created it by His will, for His glory, uh, and for a particular purpose. But the how, apart from God breathing, the, the material how, it's not in scripture. And so I'll put it to you that there's a range of beliefs from Christians. For example, uh, some people believe in what's called young earth creationism. They'll say the earth is literally six to 10,000 years old. And God, all the things that we read in uh, in Genesis, uh, we can determine 6,000 or eight, uh, eight, seven, 10, 12, 12 maybe at the outside, 1,000 years old by lining up the genealogies and the ages of people in Genesis, and that gives us 6,000 years old. Some believe that the earth is old. So you go to Genesis 1, 1, it says uh, that the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So there's already something there. God had previously, maybe four and a half billion years ago, created the world, but then he brought order in the six literal days of creation, 20-ish thousand years ago, maybe. Others believe in the time-relative creationism. Uh, So the earth is... Um, both young and old because, because time works differently now to how it worked back then and, the, and uh, the, because of inflation and the universe expanding, uh, time doesn't really, even though we might perceive it as one, per, one second per second, doesn't actually operate at one second per second. That's not the constant that we once maybe thought it was. Others think the earth is both young and old. Like if I draw a picture of a 70-year-old woman and I ask you how old is this woman, you say that woman is 70 years old and I'll say, ah I just painted her today. She's one year old. Or AKA Adam and Eve both appear young and, or, sorry, both appear old, like 20 years old or whatever, and also are one day old. Or if you cut a tree in the Garden of Eden that's three days old, has 100 rings in it, made mature. Others believe in a God-directed evolutionary process that stops at humanity. Hum- humans are a particular creation out of the dust and others believe that uh, all the way up to and including a figurative Adam and Eve who God chose as a uh, like uh, figurative head for humanity representative head for humanity Uh, and all nuance in between all I want to say is that your perspective on how we got here should not be a barrier to your faith in Jesus because there are are men and women very intelligent, very well-learned, very scientific men and women at at every point on that spectrum. Shouldn't be a barrier to your faith in Jesus. 
and I'll put it to you if someone claims, oh, this is my main issue with faith in Jesus, is evolution. Uh, I, I, I can't move on my belief in evolution. You say, okay, you don't need to. Let's talk about some other things. Maybe you come back to that if you want, uh, or, or you don't have to. Um, that should not be a barrier to faith in Jesus. Others might say, we can't measure, observe, test, or see evidence for God. One of my favorite topics uh, at uni did a research essay on the uh, fine-tuning argument uh, for God, or even just philosophically, co- the, the cosmological argument. Um, things like, uh, like William Lane Craig, he says, of all of these constants, the speed of light, gravitational constant, Planck's constant, mass energy, mass of electron, proton, neutron, uh, ratio of electron to pros mass, uh, uh, proton mass, gravitational coupling constant, cosmological constant, Hubble constant, Higgs vacuum expectation value, and about 200 other constants that are infinitesimal, infinitesimally small. If any of them were dialed, you know, one or two degrees either way, any one of the hundreds of them, then nothing would exist. And that things are so precisely tuned. Even non-Christians see this. People like uh, Sir Martin Rees, he says, uh, wherever physicists look, they see examples of fine-tuning. Or of Stephen Hawkins, no friend of Christians, uh, the remarkable fact is that the value of these numbers seem to have been finely adjusted to make possible the, de- the development of life. Or Paul Davies, this for me is powerful evidence that there is something going on behind it all. It seems as though somebody has fine-tuned nature's numbers to make the universe, the impression of design, is overwhelming, he says. And many, many others say similarly. The truth is Christians Christians should be pro-science and the most pro-science. One very famous Christian scientist, or scientist who was a Christian, uh, Johannes Kepler, he said that uh, of science, that his scientific thoughts were like thinking God's thoughts after him. So, man, I understand more of God and his thinking because the more I research things and the more I understand things, I understand more of God. In fact, in Genesis 1.28, God commands humans to go and subdue the earth. I believe, really, part of that command is that we would go and explore, have dominion over creation, to explore creation. The things we've seen just in the last hundred years in scientific advancements are part of God's creation mandate that we would go and subdue the earth, or creation. Find in it the things that are going to lead to a flourishing. We've, we mentioned this a couple of times already that in the Garden of Eden, regardless of whether you view it as figurative or literal, in the Garden of Eden, things were not perfect. They were flawless, but they weren't perfect. God put people on the earth to make more of it. Things that are perfect can't change. Therefore, it wasn't perfect. Our role is to join God in His creativity. We're made in His image. He is a creator God. He is creative. We are made creative. We are made curious. How do things work? How can we make things better? How can we explore these things? Even people who don't uh, subscribe to there being a God, people like you know Elon Musk, he's like, well, we've got to go out there. We've got to go further. We've got we to explore deeper. It's part, I believe, of this creation mandate that we go and subdue the earth. Psalms 19 says, The heavens tell of the glory of God. The skies display His marvelous craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make Him known. They make Him known. They speak without sound or word. Their voice is silent in the skies. Yet, their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to all the world. Science is thinking God's thoughts after Him helps us to understand more of Him. It gives us more of Him and, and His creative prowess and, 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 and just phenomenal might to worship. Alison McGrath, he writes in his book, The Twilight of Atheism, he says, the idea that science and religion are in perpetual conflict is no longer taken seriously, well, I just lost my stuff, is no longer taken seriously by any major historian of science despite its popularity in the late 19th century. One of the last remaining bastions of atheism survives only at the popular level. Namely, 
the myth that an atheistic fact-based science is permanently at war with a faith-based religion. I agree. Uh, at the popular level, there are people who wear the badge of science who say, well, I am like my friend. I'm a, I'm a person of science. I don't have time for fanciful stories. If I can't see it, feel it, touch it, then I don't want to know about it. In fact, I'll put it to you that there is no conflict between science and faith in Jesus, but there is a conflict from a philosophical materialism and faith in Jesus. It's actually a battle of worldviews, not a battle of science and faith. There are philosophical materialists or, or naturalists that are also scientists, and there are people who have great faith in Jesus who are also scientists. So in the Venn diagram of science in the middle, you've got naturalists over here and Christians over here, but the way that it's portrayed at the popular level and certainly in academia is, well, we naturalists own science, and you Christians are outside of science. But really what we should say is actually... Sorry, Siri. We should say, no, we, we own science. And materialists are the ones who are anti-scientific. Bold claim. Let me show you uh, how I get there from their own words. Dr. Todd, uh, Scott Todd, writing in the science journal Nature, he says, even if all the data point to an intelligent designer, such a hypothesis is excluded from science because it's not naturalistic. Leading evolutionary geneticist, Professor Richard Lewontin, he wrote, we take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Moreover, that materialism is absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So what they're saying is, we want to look at all of the, this is, this is a scientific perspective. Let's look at all of the data. Let's get every kind of thing that we could possibly find and interpret that data. Let's get a, an absolute genius like Tanglo in to help interpret the data. And for what the naturalist does is says, we can only look at data that fits this criteria. If it's outside of this data, we cannot look at it. We are not scientifically, we are philosophically opposed to looking at it. So they cannot land on there being a creator God because that's not even on the table. What is naturalism? Uh, Oxford would say the philosophical belief that everything arises from natural properties and causes and supernatural or spiritual explanations are excluded or discounted. So, when secular materialist scientists decree that naturalism or materialism is the basic premise of science, they're being arbitrary because they are not looking at any or all possible data. They don't know, cannot prove that there's no supernatural. They have a prior commitment that there cannot be supernatural. Therefore, they cannot land on the conclusion there's a supernatural. Dr. Uh, Jonathan Safati, he said, if, material, if materialism were true, then thought is just an epiphenomenon phenomenon of the brain and the result of the laws of chemistry. Thus, given their own presuppositions, predetermined by brain chemistry, but then why should their brain chemistry be trusted over mine since both obey the same infallible laws of chemistry? So in reality, if materialists were right, and they can't even help what they believe, including their belief in materialism. Yet they call themselves free thinkers, overlooking the glaring irony. Genuine initiation of thought is an un insuperable problem for materialism, as, it is, as is consciousness itself. So say, man, if we, if we can only trust our own brain chemistry and only know, or we all that is knowable is only what can be seen or touched or tangibly evidenced, then we can't even trust our own minds. 
University of Berkeley law professor, uh, Phil Johnson, he wrote in his book, The Wedge of Truth, he notes that a, philosoph a philosophy called naturalism or materialism or physicalism or simply modernism, under any of those names, this philosophy assumes that in the beginning were the fundamental particles that compose matter, energy, and the impersonal laws of physics. Or to put it personally uh, or negatively, there is no personal God who created the cosmos and governs it as an act of free will. If God exists at all, he acts only through inviolable laws of nature and adds nothing to them. So again, there is no God who intervenes in his creation like Jesus. Only God who set all, like maybe fine-tuned all of these things and then launched it, launched creation out and then his hands off. And because he is hands off, is totally uh, unknowable. All the creating had to be done by the laws and the particles, which is to say that by some combination of random choice and law-like regularity. Uh, Dr. Royal Truman, organic, organic chemist, he says, this contrasts with the common image of scientists being objective and impartial analysts who allow the empirical facts to speak for themselves. Quite the contrary, if chance plus immutable natural law must be capable of explaining all reality, then absurd explanations become acceptable given the lack of a better alternative within the permissible possibilities. So again, I am not trying to say we should be anti-science. I'm saying we should be absolutely pro-science. If science is, if science does not have a materialistic prior commitment to only a certain uh, uh, set of data. On naturalists trusting their own theories, Dr. Robert Gurney says, the fact is, or it is the fact that certain preconditions of intelligibility, such as laws of logic, uniformity of nature, absolute morality, and reliability of our senses and memory are required in order to learn about the universe. According to the naturalistic worldview, however, the universe is an accident, and there is no intelligence, plan, or purpose behind it. In that worldview, therefore, there is no logical reason why any of those preconditions should be true. Furthermore, if the human brain is merely the product of random chemical accidents, why should we trust its reasoning? The preconditions of intelligibility make sense only in a biblical worldview. According to that worldview, a real universe was created by a rational, consistent, moral God who continues to uphold it. Furthermore, God created mankind in his own image so that we are able to know him, to reason intelligibly, to explore his creation and to think God's thoughts after him. That's why modern science began in Christendom. That's why, again, we see so many of the people who, uh, like the foundations of science, modern science, are built on their backs, did so in response to their faith not in spite of their faith. Please make sure when you hear a new scientific theory or discovery that this time finally proves God wrong, they're not just listening to a naturalistic philosophy dressed up as science. Make sure that it's not just naturalism purporting to be plainly rational interpretation of the best data that necessarily excludes data it doesn't like. Uh, proponents of this philosophy, they're not uh, just rational secularists. They are dogmatic evangelists of their philosophy. Again, it, these are battling worldviews, both claiming science, both looking to science. Hopefully, Christian scientists, scientists who are Christians, are the ones who are happy to look at any and all data, because we're not committed to a a a, a, um, a prior um, truth. For example, we want to understand the truth. We believe that our truth will stack up with the reality of the world, and so we want to discover the world as it is, not to necessarily exclude a divine being. So, as Christians, we can, we should investigate the world, because in doing so, we see more of the greatness of God. If naturalistic, philosophical, naturalistic evangelists can't beat you with better science, they'll certainly ridicule you until it's just unfashionable to be on your team. I think that's the real reason, genuinely, the real reason 
that the popular belief in the West, at least, is that science and faith are enemies. It's not because science and faith are enemies. When more scientists than not believe in God, and more people in the world, and more people who have ever existed in the world believe in a God than not, um, that most of the uh, like the pillars of science throughout history and even today are even Bible-believing Christians. Uh, it's because we're not beaten with better science. So we are beat down philosophically to the point where we, it's unfashionable to be a Christian. Uh, slurs like, you know, you believe in that uh, flying spaghetti monster or fairy tales, uh, things like this. They're not good arguments. They are ad hominem attacks to make it unpalatable to be associated with. Which Christians should disregard those kinds of attacks and pursue the best science. We should be the best scientists. If you're a, if you're a Christian and you're curious and you enjoy the sciences, can I encourage you to pursue a career in the sciences? for your own sake, so that you can be part of thinking God's thoughts after him. You can see more of God at work in the world. And hopefully so that you can contribute more of our understanding of, of how amazing and glorious God is, leading to more glory to God. But also so that we can have more Christians who are not just arguing, but demonstrating what it looks like to be propelled by your faith to science. The heavens do tell of the glory of God. The skies display his marvelous craftsmanship. Day after day, they continue to speak night after night. They make him known. They speak without a sound or a word. Their voice is silent in the skies, yet their message has gone out to all the earth and their words to all the world. By him, all things were created in heaven and earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, for him. He's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Again, Jesus claimed, not only am I the God of creation, not only am I that God who breathed and the universe comes into existence in obedience to my voice. Yes, he's saying, I am that magnificent. He's saying, not only am I majestic, but also I love my creation so much that even though the people I made in my image to reflect my glory in the world who rebelled against me and made me their enemy, that I have come to intervene to upend the natural order of things so that they would not die in their rebellion unto destruction, but rather they would be made new in newness of life and so that they would know me, not just as a distant, powerful God, but as a loving, caring God. Not just saved from death to life, saved into his family, even into union with Jesus himself. This is the God who intervenes in his own creation. This is why Jesus came for us. It's why he saved us. It's why he gives this story about you know, to the paralytic to, to put on a, like a little display about why he came and what he's come to do. I believe firmly it's why uh, the earth is not in the center of the universe while we're in the grandstands so we can look out and see the majesty of creation knowing this is not about us. This is about God and his majesty and yet he stoops, he humbles, he, that God humbles himself to not just intervene in his creation but to join creation to himself by becoming one of us. And then joining us to himself in union with Jesus unto new life, unto eternal life with him. 
not just a powerful God, but a merciful, loving, gracious, kind God who loves you. Uh, I believe he's drawing you to himself even tonight. Let's pray together. Father, again, just want to thank you for your goodness and your kindness to us. You reconciling all things to yourself, fulfilled in Jesus. Thank you that science, as it is, points to you, shows us more of you, gives us more of you and a greater understanding of you to worship. Help us to worship you more uh, as you deserve, to help us see how small and seemingly inconsequential we are in light of all that you've created and yet to see how greatly and highly you have valued us by not leaving us to die in our sin, but sending Jesus to die on our behalf, to reconcile us to you. God, you're so wonderful to us. So help us respond to you in faith to receive this grace that you have for us. We would run to you, not from you. We would, uh, Father, help us to never be afraid of science, uh, but like, like um, Kepler, to see it as thinking your thoughts after you. Father, even maybe uh, from among us, that we would see people who would um, pursue science uh, as if it's some homogenous field, but you know, pursue understanding of uh, the natural order of things that would lead to a greater human flourishing, lead to more glory for you. I'm sorry for those times we have misrepresented you to the world. We've, uh, when we've made it seem like we're at odds with science. And Father, help us to winsomely and lovingly go to those who have left or abandoned their faith because of a misunderstanding of naturalism uh, as opposed to science and, and help us, Lord, not to beat them down with arguments, but to uh, lovingly restore them. Father, I'm just so thankful for uh, the many people who have come to you, who've drawn to yourself even through their scientific discoveries and work. They see in creation there is more than just what they can feel and touch and observe as you draw them by your Holy Spirit to yourself. We thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.